Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Ahabatu fillah We reached the next uh, portion of the treaties in our study of uh, purification and salat about the things that nullify a person's wudu things that break your wudu basically so given that you've become now aware of how ablution is performed so the last lesson we talked about how to make wudu how to make ablution and what its conditions are you know what its shurut are and the obligatory practices and the sunan of the wudu we talked about the sunan those things which are not an obligation but you'll get reward for doing them and now then that leads to the next thing that we need to talk about and that is what nullifies your wudu what breaks your uh, ablution so every muslim should know that there are things that nullify his or her his or her uh, ablution and that it becomes completely null if any of them are done so meaning if you fall into one of these nawaka al wudu one of these things that nullify your your wudu that means you your tahara is broken your tahara is broken uh so we'll go ahead and mention the things nullifying ablution are of two types uh the first are the direct nullifiers those things uh that are so they they are the matters that cause the nullification of ablution directly such as urine stool the kramakamala and whatever comes out of the anus and the sexual organ the kramakamala so whatever comes out of the as they say sabilain in arabic they say sabilain the two paths meaning a kramakala the back and the front then that nullifies your wudu that breaks your wudu uh, the indirect nullifiers so those are the direct ones these are the indirect ones that means they're not they're not uh, direct they are the matters that cause nullification of ablution indirectly or makes the validity of ablution uh, doubtful such such matters include unconsciousness being uh, knocked out okay or, or fainting or something like this uh, similar states like sleeping feigning insanity uh so those things there's some shubha there's some doubt meaning they don't always nullify your wudu uh especially when it comes to sleeping okay the reason is that if one is in a state of unconsciousness one becomes unable to feel what comes out of one's body or what one does thus doubt in such cases is regarded as an actual nullifying factor so it's not just because you are unconscious but it's because you don't know and so since you have no concept when if someone faints or if they are knocked out or they are in a deep sleep then they must make wudu that is broken their wudu if they went to bed or before that state they had tahara they were uh on purification but now they have fainted or they were knocked out in the fight or they um, fell into a deep sleep then their wudu that considered their wudu or their wudu is considered invalidated okay that nullifies their tahara uh, so we can easily classify the things nullifying wudu as follows number one whatever comes out of the stool and urine exits the karma such as stool wind urine sperm pre preseminal fluid and unusual menstrual blood that which is uh so menstruation but also even uh uh and postpartum bleeding like this stool and urine are among the direct things nullifying ablution according to the religious text and juristic consensus as when allah the exalted uh reveal the cases that ob uh, obligate ablution he said or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself and this is in surah al-ma'idah verse 6 as for akramakum allah sperm and preseminal fluid meaning before 
uh, pre, we call it premature ejaculation of chromochrome log. They nullify ablution according to the authentic ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ reported in this regard, and the juristic consensus reported by Ibn al-Mundhir and others. So the scholars have ijma or consensus about this as reported by Ibn al-Mundhir as regards to uh, that uh, what's called mini and al-midi in Arabic. The, uh, as we said, sperm and then that, the, the pre- uh, premature e e ejaculation right. as regards to istihada istihada okay in Arabic we say hide we know hide hide means when a woman is on her menstruation she's bleeding istihada is uh, a blood from the woman who's not in a state of uh her menses. So we call this uh, dim facet. It is its blood which is um, impure, but the hukum, the ruling is different than a woman who's on her menses. Woman on her menses, she can't pray, she can't, uh, you know, grab the mushaf, she can't uh, sit in the masjid, all the other ahkam, and she can't fast. It's haram for her. But the woman on istihada, the hukum is different. The ruling is different. So istihada, this blood which comes from the, also from the women in the same place, but it is not menstruation blood. So it comes outside of their time for menses or something like this, from whatever reason, some sickness or something. Then this, uh, this uh, also nullifies your wudu. Istihada and nullifies your wudu according to the ahadith reported in this regard and the juristic consensus reported by Ibn al Mundar and others. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, according to the hadith reported by Fatima bint Abu Hubaysh, uh, anha, mentioning that she was afflicted with istihada. And when she asked the Prophet وسلم, about its ruling, he وسلم, said to her, Perform ablution and then you can offer the prayer for it is due only to a vein okay so the one a woman who has istihada which is different than menses and different men different from postpartum bleeding she can pray but she must <coughs> she must make wudu for every salat fahamtum we understand she has to make wudu for every salat when she has this blood if it's not from her her period. Uh, and this is an according to that hadith. This hadith was related by Abu Dawood and Daraqutni who said that all the transmitter, transmitters of the hadith were trustworthy. Likewise, breaking wind nullifies ablution according to the sound a hadith narrated in this regard, as well as the juristic consensus. Okay? For example, the Prophet وسلم, said, La yakbal Allah salata ahadakum ida ahtada hatta yabda wadlu. We studied that hadith the last time that uh, Allah doesn't accept the prayer of any one of you if he has hadith uh, until he makes wudu. And this hadith here, uh, especially with regards to the wudu, this is the minor hadith like urine, stool, and passing gas. Okay. Also, in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, Allah will not accept the prayer of any one of you if he passes urine, stool, or breaks wind until he performs ablution. So also similar to that same uh, hadith. Also, the Prophet والسلام, said in this regard, regarding one's uncertainty whether one had broken wind or not. And I think we talked about this hadith before, and we will study it again. Uh, one should not leave prayer to re-perform ablution unless one hears sound uh, or smells something. Okay? So meaning if you have doubt, if you have doubt, are you, did you break your wudu or not? You have doubt, and you're in prayer. You're not sure. Sometimes the shaitan whispers to you. Or sometimes you actually, some people, they break, they break their wudu in prayer. So the way you know, the qayud, if you will, the, the conditions, if you will. The Prophet ﷺ said, one should not leave prayer unless one hears sound or smells something. So if you smell something or you hear something definitely, then 
uh, then you break, then your your salat is invalid. You you break your salat and you go make wudu. Okay, so if you're in the jama'ah, if you're the imam, whatever the case may be, you smell something uh, or you hear something <clears throat> from yourself, then you you leave the prayer. But if it's just was was, you're not really sure. You know, it's some doubt. Then you just you leave the doubt. But if you're for sure, even if you didn't smell it, something, but you know you did, you feel it directly. You know, it's for sure you pass gas. Well, of course, if you for sure you broke your wudu, halas, you leave the, the prayer. But if you have doubt and you're not sure and you don't smell and you don't hear anything, then continue in your prayer. Mafum. Right. As for what comes out of one's body other than urine, stool, and the aforesaid secretion, such as blood, vomit, nosebleed, and the like, scholars <coughs> disagree whether such things nullify ablution or not. Yet the preponderant opinion is that it does not nullify ablution, those things. Okay. However, if one re-performs ablution in this case to avoid such a juristic disagreement, it is better. So it's safer, the Sheikh is saying. The second, uh, the second category, or if you will, among the things nullifying ablution is mental unconsciousness, as we said, either due to insanity or due to sleeping or fainting and the like. Thus, the ablution of one in such a state is deemed no, meaning it's no longer valid, as there is suspicion in this case that something has come out of one's body, such as a drop of urine, wind, or the like, while one is unaware. Still, dozing is regarding as an exceptional case. It does not nullify wudu. As the Prophet Sallallahu companions, companion, used to doze while waiting for prayer in the masjid. So they would stay in the prayer and stay and wait for Salat al-Isha. And sometimes they would doze off, you know. But they didn't go get up and make wudu after that. Okay. Uh, in a word, only deep sleep causes the nullification of ablution according to the ample legal proofs. So deep sleep. Meaning, uh, one of my mashayikh, they, they mention in a dars. He said, basically, for example, you have the miswak. And you are, you have it in your hand. Sometimes this happens to me on an airplane and different things like this. And uh, you, you have this and you fall asleep. If you fall asleep and you drop the miswak and you don't pick it up, you don't, you're unconscious of it, then that, that uh, level of sleep you make wudu. But if you feel that, you know, you're, it's a light sleep. You know, you feel you lose something on your hand and you, you wake up immediately, you know, because you, you're semi-conscious. You're not totally in a deep sleep. If you're not totally in a deep sleep like that, full sleep, then this doesn't nullify your wudu. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, conditions. The third category, if you will, eating meat of camels. Okay, eating camel meat, a little or even a lot is also one of the things nullifying ablution according to the authentic ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this, reward, uh, in this regard. Imam Ahmed radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that there are two authentic hadiths ascribed to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this regard. Still eating any lawful meat other than that of camels does not cause ablution to be no. So if you eat... Um, um, goat or sheep, it doesn't nullify your wudu. There's a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about that, and he said in shit, meaning if you want. If you want, you can make wudu. So it doesn't nullify your wudu. But the camel meat, according to those authentic hadith, as Imam Ahmed mentioned, uh, that those uh, are evidence that camel meat, eating camel meat, breaks your wudu. Camel milk, what about camel milk? Uh-uh. You're right, absolutely. Camel milk does not break your wudu. Good job. And uh, another thing, interesting enough, now I don't know Allahu Alam, so I'm not going to bring this mess up. Forget it. Okay? Uh, anyhow, but I think there's no delil for it. I will bring it up anyway. Camel urine. What about drinking camel urine? Is it okay? It is okay. You're wrong this time. Because there's a hadith of the Prophet, or there's evidence 
<clears throat> to support the drinking of camel urine as a type of medicine. And, you know, it has other uses. As far as it breaking your wudu, I don't know of any dalil that it breaks your wudu, though. You know, because it's obviously it's halal. And there's no evidence to suggest that it breaks your wudu. But eating the meat of the camel breaks your wudu because we have evidence for that. Baib. <clears throat> There are some other issues on which scholars disagree whether they nullify ablution or not, such as touching one's akramakam Allah private part, uh, touching a woman lustfully for a man if he touches a woman he, with desires. Some of the scholars say that breaks his wudu. The sound opinion in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best is that it does not break your wudu. Uh, the one thing that has pretty strong difference of opinion is touching the private parts. Okay? Uh, does that with meaning without uh, any clothes on does this break your wudu or not? Okay, and the safest is to make wudu uh, Washing the body of a deceased person. This is also something where there's a lot of ikhtilaf between between the ulama and Apostasy if someone leaves Islam, so that's pretty strong that they should uh, Make wudu that breaks their wudu and obviously it breaks their Islam as well, but if they want to after that they bear they take the shahada They are no longer on tahara if that mesala if that happens, okay um, Good and Some scholars view that each of the above mentioned matters that we just mentioned causes the nullification of ablution while others maintain that it does not the issue is still controversial and a subject to analogical deduction. Yet, reperforming ablution in such cases so as to avoid the disagreement is better. So meaning that it's ahwat. So Imam Fozan, we can see from some of these masail, he's taken the opinion which is considered al-ahwat. You know, the safest view. Since there's difference of opinion, then safe. the safest thing is that it breaks your wudu, that you know, you make wudu and then you're, you're you're out of the disagreement. You're 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 safe regardless. Either way, okay. Uh, there is still an important issue in this regard that should be clarified, namely the case when one is certain about the validity of one's ablution. Then one suspects that any of the things nullifying ablution has taken place. What should one do in this case? Okay. So that means you are you had tahara for sure, and now you have doubt about your tahara. It is stated that the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith uh, related uh, in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'anhu and he said if one of you feels any flatulence uh, while being in a state of wudu and is doubtful whether anything has caused issued from him or not he should not leave the mosque unless he hears a sound or perceives a smell and this is the hadith we just mentioned uh, so the Prophet وسلم, a man came to him and he was in doubt he was complaining and he said you know I feel doubt and I, had, I was in prayer and I don't know if I broke my wudu or not, and the Prophet then said, which we already mentioned, do not leave the prayer unless you hear something or smell something. So the point with this hadith, uh, and Imam Fuzan, he's going to explain it, so we, we won't even, we'll just go right to his explanation. This honorable hadith, as well as similar ones that state the same meaning, indicates that if one who is certain about one's purity, then doubts it, one should deem oneself pure and act accordingly okay this is because the original ruling is that one is still in a state of purity as purity is certain in this case and the nullification of ablution here is based on mere suspicion or doubt the certainty is not to be eliminated because of doubtfulness this is in fact a great generic ruling to be applied in all cases okay namely the original ruling is to remain applicable until otherwise is verified by contrast if one is certain about the nullification of one's evolution 
and suspects its valid validity, meaning they have doubt if it's valid, one has to re-perform ablution as the original case here is one's minor ritual impurity which is not abrogated due to mere suspicion. But al khalasa of what he's saying here is that there's a, a, a qaida fiqiyya. This is a fiqh principle, a very important fiqh principle that you need to memorize. It will help you in so many things when you're making tawaf, when you, uh, issues about your salat, how many rakats you are on, how many, uh, do you have wudu or not? Do you need to make wudu or not? All of these things uh, and many things in your ibadat are built upon this principle from this direct hadith that we just mentioned. And that is al yaqeen la yuzul bi shak. al yaqeen la yuzul bi shak which means that certainty, when you're certain about something, doubtfulness does not harm it, doesn't ruin it. Doubtfulness does not ruin it. But you are in Salat, and you just remember about that you made uh, wudu for uh, the Salat before. For sure, you remember you made wudu. But now you're not sure if you broke your wudu because you kind of remember going to the bathroom at some point. You can't remember if that was before then. You're just not sure. What should you do? Should you continue praying or should you break your salat and make wudu? Huh? Break, break salat and make wudu. Okay. Huh? Keep praying. Uh-huh. Another. Keep praying. You. Okay, huh? Oh, a jamhur. Majority say, keep praying. And this man says, break the wudu. Break your salat. The answer is, you keep praying. Because. Why? Because you were sure you had wudu. But you have doubt, whisperings now, if that you broke your wudu. So, that which you're sure of is not removed by doubt. Doubtfulness does not hurt what you're positive about. In all situations, fight. So, you, uh, you are making, you're praying. Okay, you're not sure if you're going. If you, this is the second or third raka. You're not sure. Well, in that situation, in applying this principle, that means you are sure, for sure, if you don't know if you're on the second or third, then that means for sure you're on the second. And you doubt about the third. Because you said two or three. You said, I don't know if I'm on two or three. Well, between two and three, that means you are either two or three. So that means you're for sure on two, and you have doubt about three. You understand? Because... Because of going back to that qaida, because you just said you're not sure if you have done two rakat or three, you're not sure if you're on the second or the third. Mabni ala yaqeen. So that means you build your prayer on that which you are certain of. If you're certain, you're certain about two or three, or I mean, you you you're not sure if you have two or three. That means for sure you have two at least. Three is where your doubt is. You're not sure really if you have that third one or not. Right. So then, Mabni ala yaqeen, you build your prayer on the two. That's very important. If you get that, that will help you in so many thick issues. So many things in your ibadah. Bye. O Muslim, you should keep yourself pure and, and verify your ablution whenever you stand for prayer. And care for the validity of your ablution as much as you can. For prayer without valid ablution is invalid. You should also be aware of the insinuation and shaitan's whispers that cause you to doubt the validity of your ablution and making you in a state of doubt and confusion. That's very important. Now some people, they are, many people are affected by waswas, you know, by whisperings of the shaitan and whisperings of their selves. However, some people actually are sickness. They have a, 
a, a, a what do you call it a marad nafsi nafsiya they have a um, a sickness uh, you know like a kind of a mental a mental issue with this they are i forget what what some of the terminologies you say for someone who has you know who is uh who's always who's never sure they call them compulsive what do they call obsessive compulsive sometimes people have this kind of disorder or like this so they're not sure some people have it to that extreme some people they don't many people don't and so if you're one who's not on that level you can really apply this this principle and it can help you for so many issues that you don't let the shaitan even if shaitan is whispering and say man i remember i remember i went to the bathroom but i'm sure i made wudu just a couple a little bit but I'm doubting about the bathroom. Khalas. You continue in your prayer or you don't need to make wudu. Because you're sure that you made wudu. But if it's the other way, I remember for sure I was in the bathroom at Karamakam Allah. But I'm not sure if I made wudu or not. So then you don't have wudu. Because your doubt is on wudu and your surety is that you broke wudu. So that's how you apply that principle. I am. Good. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant and loves those who purify themselves. In the law, you have bo, uh, uh, I can't think of the ayah, but anyway, in Surah Al Baqarah, indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who repent and those who are purified okay so it's very important to to gain this knowledge and practice it in your tahara and we ask Allah the almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil anything i said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. anything i said that was incorrect was for myself and the shaitan